telehealth life has been on us the last couple of months. Pretty much any psychologist in the Sydney area is oh, nice focusing. I have all these fears around, you know, what if they think I'm too young or too inexperienced? For lunch, I think I'm going to make a... Supervision is done. Um, that was really cool. What aspects of your job do you really enjoy versus not so much? <laughs> How do you feel? <laughs> Hi, my name is Ro. I'm a psychologist from Sydney, Australia, and today I'm going to show you a day in my life of a psychologist in lockdown. And so I'm going to be doing full telehealth sessions today. Actually, let me show you my outfit. I'm wearing just like a, a top. I might chuck a blazer on top of it and sweatpants and slippers. Yeah, perfect. Telehealth life has been on us the last couple of months. Pretty much any psychologist in Sydney area, any health professional really, we're all trying to work from home. And so for all my adult clients, they can all be seen online. It's a lot easier than some of the kids where we might need to be in person. So today I'm just gonna take you along on a full day. I'll tell you what my clients are kind of like, obviously. Things are going to be changed a little bit to remain confidential. A little bit about the notating process and the... Oh, I don't even know. Just join me. Okay. So I made some kimbap last night. This... Oh, nice focusing. I might also do some cherry tomatoes and... An apple? So before we get started, I always look through all of my client notes from last week. And at the end of every note, I always put in, actually, let me see if I can show you. So for each note, I have appointment number, patient presentation. So what they might've looked like, you know, today they rocked up looking really disheveled or today they rocked up. I don't say rocked up. Their mood seemed elevated today or they seemed incredibly energetic today. And so you might just uh, put some notes on what the experience of being in the session is like. Then we have a summary of the session. So kind of the things we discussed, techniques we might've introduced, new things or information that have come up. Then I have home task, which is the practice task for the week. Most forms of therapy are quite active. And so you've got something to go home to practice and to do and to apply to your real life. Before I started, I used to think, Psychology was a place where you'd go and you'd talk about your feelings and that was the good part of it. Now I know it's actually seeing a psychologist is kind of like that touch point where you maybe get a bit of insight into something or you learn a new skill or you have a different way of thinking about something. And then a lot of the actual movement, a lot of the progress is based on the client. So what they do during the week when they go out and they take that skill and they apply it. And then lastly, I have next appointment, which is where I put my plan for next appointments. Alrighty, so I am painted that. Do you like it? I'm hopping onto CoView, which is our telehealth system. And basically you enter like a telehealth room and then your client has a link to your room. And if they click into your link, they can actually join your room. So it's pretty cool. It's like a virtual office basically. And so when I go in for supervision this afternoon, I'll hop onto a link to join my supervisor's room. Okay, I'm gonna get started. I've got one more minute left, so I'm gonna breathe. Everything's planned and all I can do now is just be present. So chat to you later. Bye. Just finished my first session. I did go a little bit over time. He introduced a kind of new topic kind of in the last two minutes when we were trying to wrap up and talk about homework. And sometimes uh, that's on me for not holding the boundaries as tight, but also trying to be kind to myself and say, couldn't have expected it. He had it in his mind and we flagged it as really important and we're gonna discuss it next session. So sometimes sessions go really nicely to time and we've got it perfectly timed out and sometimes it just falls apart. At least I'm getting better to definitely finishing before the hour though, because I used to have sessions where I'd go like five, 10 minutes over the hour and that wasn't so good. <laughs> Alrighty, well, I'm gonna 
just finish up my notes and then get prepped for my next session. I just wanted to tell you about my way of wrapping up sessions, especially if we're getting a little bit over time. And there is a psychologist phrase that every psychologist uses, which is, oh, I'm just aware of the time. And so usually clients go, oh yes, of course, let's review practice tasks and get on with it. Okay, next, four sessions down. I've actually got lunch time and then I've got a free hour until supervision. For lunch, I think I'm gonna make a grilled salmon salad wrap or i could do it on rice i don't know i'll think about it so recap of my sessions this morning but one of my clients i'm doing kind of like a little bit of schema therapy schemas are kind of like filters through which we see the world and usually they're filters that we've developed through earlier experiences so things that might have happened in childhood or early adolescence and they're quite formative experiences that might inform the way that we see the world when we're adults. Please note this is an illustrative example and not all hate directed at one Mr. Neville Longwater who I adore. Diagnosis and absence of meaning and client is never advised, authorised by the Psych Diaries legal team Sydney, Australia. For instance, you know Neville Longbottom from the Harry Potter films? Started really nerdy looking and then like totally glowed up and got really attractive and there were like news reports about him and how he glowed up. For someone like Neville, he, he might have grown up with this idea that he was unattractive or that he was not as handsome as other people and he wasn't as desirable as other people. Because he's had all of that evidence and people telling him and you know bullying from an early or young age, maybe when he grows up, even when he turns out to have you know totally glowed up, Neville Longbottom might still have this fear that people don't find me attractive or people don't love me or you know I'm not as attractive as other people and so that's kind of a silly example but it, it's a good example of how even when the reality doesn't match what we believe anymore we're still gonna have that schema because we've found evidence for it for years and years of experience we've built that the schema gets stronger and stronger and so when it comes to schema therapy, it's trying to figure out what types of schemas someone might have and actually saying, you know, actually this schema is not true for me anymore or it doesn't serve me anymore and actually let's start challenging and looking at this schema deeper. I'm going to go and cook lunch now and I'm going to take you along. Let's go. Got rocket, tomatoes, salmon. We have run out of oil in this household, so I'm using this spray oil that we use for barbecues. Some salt, and then we go skin side down. Pan wasn't hot enough, whatever. I'm feeling a little bit sleepy and so I think I'm gonna go for a walk now. If I'm not doing any particular exercise, but just going outside and I'll take you guys with me. I might put a jacket on and a hat. I am always sun safe. It's funny how quickly one can transform from looking professional to a little bit of a homebody. Okay, let's go for a walk. Doors closing. Elevator going down. So, there is some kind of caution. I think someone's moving in today. We are mandated to wear masks everywhere we go because Sydney is currently in lockdown. That's so nice. Oh my god. I'm so dizzy. 
I kid you not, that thing is dangerous. I couldn't get off it. <laughs> okay, continuing on. Back, first thing, hand washing. Safety first. So like I said before, Sydney's been in lockdown for oh, a while now, I think three months. And we are gonna start having some loosening of restrictions when we've reached 70% of New South Wales at a double dosage of the vaccine. And right now, the last time I checked, we were on 40 something. But it's good to have some hope of when we might be able to get out of lockdown. And I am really hoping it'll be when we can get back into the clinic. The strange thing is some of the clients that I'm seeing now in adult clinic are people I've actually never met in real life before because they started while we were in lockdown. And so it'd be lovely to, you know, meet a client or two. <laughs> and even though, you know, we can connect and we can talk, it's not the same as being able to, to see them in real life or to sit in a room with them and to share that space together and that's a really important part of therapy i think is having that space together i'm also going to reapply this is the peri para ink uh well how do people do this there we go <laughs> um and it's a lip stain thingy as you can see i'm not really a makeup guru here but i like it because once you put it on you don't have to reapply it hours just stays on there we go there were a couple of sessions where you know i was like oh telehealth there's no point like putting any makeup on and then i looked at myself in the screen and i was like i looked half dead <laughs> which is fine but you know i don't want my psychologist to look like they're exhausted and don't have the energy to talk to me and so i've started to wear a little bit more makeup to hopefully look a bit more awake. I've got half an hour left till supervision. Supervision is always really nice because I have uh, a bit of time just to talk about all the tricky clients I might be having or clients that are going really well. Um, I raise questions, I talk about how I'm doing, like self-care. If there are new clients, I swing them by my supervisor just so he kind of has an idea of everyone I'm seeing. Um, and the, the level of supervision slowly starts to decrease as you get more and more experienced. But because I'm still a registrar, which means that I'm not fully endorsed yet. So right now I'm still just a general psychologist. I'm not a clinical psychologist yet. There's still quite um, a lot of supervision involved. Yeah, so I'm gonna spend the next little bit just prepping for supervision um, and looking over some of the things that I sent to clients this morning Morning. And yeah, and then I'll launch into this arbor. Let go. Pop in a time lapse. Let's go. Let's go. Supervision is done. Um, that was really cool. Sometimes I have a lot of questions because a lot of stuff comes up and I just have lots of very specific questions about certain clients. Like, what do I do with this client because I'm stuck? And sometimes like today we have a little bit of time just to talk about therapy models and maybe the ways in which they overlap. He's a very empirical way of thinking. And so it's very evidence-based. It's all about research. Sometimes when you read about cases where there's been misconduct or ethical breaches, it's about people taking therapy and making it very casual or unregulated and just fully based on, you know, well, I, I did this with a couple of clients and it worked quite well and so I'm using it now. Whereas I think true therapy is a research, scientific, empirically based practice. <laughs> to wrap up in supervision, we talked about two different clients. I had specific questions around their concerns and then we also talked a little bit about how I might be able to apply schema aspects to a cognitive behavioral therapy model. Um, and for those who have no idea what I just said, totally fine. Literally until my master's training, you don't learn about any of those therapies in undergrad or high school or even in books. The lecturers will walk you through everything. So for those who keep asking me, what do I read? What do I study? To be completely honest, you really don't need to. No need to rush it. And when the time comes that you're actually doing therapeutic work, it's much more helpful to learn a therapy model then because then you can actually apply it. So you can learn it one day and then two days later, you can actually apply it and use it with someone. Alrighty, next client, let's go. Okay, done. 
<laughs> last session done. I just saw an older gentleman and I always get a little bit anxious that I'm not very relatable and I have all these fears around, you know, what if they think I'm too young or too inexperienced or whatever, but this client's really lovely and also quite insightful. And so we just had a really good second session together and we did something called a formulation. A formulation is like a working psychological model of what's happening in the client's life or what might be causing a particular cycle. He really connected to it and we have a bit of a game plan in terms of what we're gonna do going forwards. Right, -o. now I am going to write up the notes. Therapy is really fun. <laughs> Sometimes I really, really enjoy it and today's one of those days. Post on Instagram about asking me questions about things during a clinic day. I have a couple of questions around people asking if they can ask me personal questions or if they can directly contact me about uh, career questions and stuff like that. I do apologize. I try and get to as many as I can but I'm also trying to work on setting some boundaries for myself. Unfortunately for a lot of the career questions that people ask me, especially if like international students, I actually have no idea about the requirements between different countries and stuff like that. And so I can speak to my own journey and you know things that I can do day to day, but really recommend reaching out to your uni or reaching out to the uni that you'd like to get into and they have admissions people who are way more experienced and can speak to those. But I have a couple of questions here. What aspects of your job do you really enjoy versus not so much? I really enjoy how interesting it is. So I really enjoy sessions where we're talking about you know people's histories, we're talking about how it's affecting them now, we're talking about their thoughts, we're talking about you know cycles that they're getting into and it's so satisfying when people have those light bulb like aha moments of oh of course you know that experience or that thought is causing me to do this and sometimes just that awareness is what leads to a lot of change and so I love those kind of moments where we're really kind of expanding perspective. Uh, sessions that don't enjoy it so much are you know more difficult sessions where maybe a client is not so open to change or maybe there are some additional difficulties and so I do find uh, working with really young children with more developmental disabilities is harder and that's mostly because the, there's not as much movement, it is a bit slower and also the types of things that we do I don't feel as competent in and so I, I don't really feel like I'm making as much of a difference but in saying that a lot of my child work is in autism and I guess the more I train in it I do actually feel better about doing it. It really is like, if I feel like I'm making a difference, I feel so much better doing the work because I feel like I'm being helpful. Aspects I don't like, accounting. Oh my gosh, accounting is the worst. <laughs> I just did my tax return for this year and I, oh, just, I really liked maths during high school, but accounting is a whole new kettle of fish, so. <laughs> Questions around, do I get paid if people are sick? So if I'm sick, no, I don't get paid at all for those days. If my clients are sick, it depends how they cancel. So usually if they're canceling within 24 hours, I either charge the full session fee if they've done it multiple times, or I charge half the session fee if it's, you know, a special circumstance. And sometimes if it, if they get kind of give me a reason that I'm kind of like, yeah, no one could have really predicted that, you know, got in a car accident, family members at an accident, they've needed to rush to medical. Usually that and I, I just kind of waive the fee. When you first go to clinic, you actually sign a form talking about cancellation fees. And if you don't rock up to the session, what do you do? And so most clients are aware that hour could have been given to someone else in need. And how do I come up with treatment plans? Uh, that is a very involved question. Uh, usually the first session is learning about the patient. The second session is doing that formulation that we talked about. And every single person's formulation is different. This particular client I thought was very suitable for CBT, so I did a CBT formulation. You learn about that in your studies, you know, what type of client is suitable to what type of therapy and where the direction of therapy will go fully depends on who the client is. I am the one who decides what the treatment plan is, but that is fully been informed by what is well-researched, empirically supported, and there's evidence behind what is most useful. <laughs> Someone asked, can you please share about financial planning as a freelancer? <laughs> Ask me in a year. Right now, no. I have an accountant and I send everything to him and he gives me back a form. And I'm going to be honest, I don't understand most of the things on that form. If there's one area in which I've really slacked off and I have no idea about, it's my finances this year. <laughs> so unfortunately, I am not an expert at all about that. 
I hope that's helpful. And if you guys would like to submit questions, come check out my Instagram. And I also just really wanted to note that for people who are sending messages that you, know, you just tell me a bit about your history or you just tell me a bit about your life, but it's just so lovely getting to know you guys beyond just the comment section. Like sometimes I hop on your profiles and I do a bit of a stalk and that's always a little bit of fun. So thank you guys all for joining me and I'm actually not going to wrap up the video here. I'm probably going to show you a bit about my tonight, but that wraps up the clinic day portion of the video. So yeah, that's my day. Cool. <laughs> This is Karen Iricardo, their world famous salsa dancers. Just realized I might have to mute this part of the video. Look at that, what on earth? <gasps> they are ridiculous and I do salsa dancing and Latin dancing, but I, <laughs> this is just. Um, so I have done a whole hour of absolutely nothing, which is nice just to recharge. Can I ground myself? And now I know it's nighttime and it's chill time for me. And so I might take a shower. I don't usually shower at this point. I usually shower right before bed, but as you can see from today, I am living the grease ball life. On other clinic days, I might do a workout after work or I might go straight to cooking dinner if I finish late. Yeah, today's a bit of a gloomy-ish kind of day. So I kind of just feel like staying in and I'm gonna do a workout tomorrow morning. Probably gonna do some boxing. Start of dinner. That's a gravy. That's a lamb shoulder that you can see. I cooked it yesterday. I have these little veggie patties I made as well as flatbreads. Now with a quick salad and a tzatziki dressing. If I can find a cucumber, that is. Nice. Yay! So we've got tzatziki, lamb shoulder that I roasted for like four hours yesterday, side salad, veggie patties, and these wrap things, I forgot what they were called. Peter wraps? Peter wraps, yes, those. Mm -hmm. Very lamby. Like. I roasted it with a lot of rosemary yesterday. <laughs> How do you feel? <laughs> This is not spark joy. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You'll get better. So close to winning as well. That's the thing. I was so close to winning.